Okay, so um, the topic of the lecture today is measuring public opinion, right? And so we've said public opinion, sort of the, the basic definition of public opinion, is that it is the sum of a whole bunch of individual opinions, right? Whether we're talking about in a city, in a state, or in the whole country. Public opinion is the sum of a whole bunch of individual opinions. So we're going to break the lecture today into kind of four main areas and take a look at, um, starting with, the development of the modern opinion poll. Okay. Um, so the modern opinion poll is what we would refer to as a scientific poll, which we'll go into, into in just a minute a little more um, detail about the modern opinion poll. But before we develop scientific polls, most opinion polling was done by something called a straw <laughs> poll. A straw poll. And a straw poll is an informal way to gather people's opinions. Before we had the modern opinion poll, we figured out people's opinions through straw polls. And a straw poll is an informal way of gathering people's opinions. So what would be, you know, think back 1920s, 1930s, what would be an informal way to see what people think? Raise your hand, Raise your hand right? Right? That, that's a straw poll. Well, you know, just raise your hand. Or, um, you know, uh, a little bit later on, as telephones are more prevalent, using the telephone. Right? Call this number if. Okay? Now, we use the telephone today, but it's done differently. So, a straw poll is very informal. Usually done by some sort of simple method, like just raising hands. Now, how we got to a modern opinion poll, a scientific poll, had to do with a sort of a rivalry between these two different groups. Well, one group and one person. On the left here is an, a, a magazine that was very popular in the early 1900s, Literary Digest. The guy on the right here is George Gallup. Gallup polls. Very good. Okay. So, backstory here. Literary Digest was known for doing a straw poll ahead of the presidential election every year. Right? That was kind of one of their things. That every four years they would do a big straw poll, a very informal poll, and then say, here's who we think is going to win the election. And they had correctly predicted several presidential elections in a row using their straw poll. But in 1936... They got it totally wrong. <laughs> they predicted that Franklin Roosevelt was going to lose the election to a guy named Alf Landon. Now, you don't really need to know that name. He's just a guy that was running against Franklin Roosevelt. But they predicted Roosevelt was going to lose. But then comes along this guy, George Gallup. And George Gallup conducted an opinion poll differently. George Gallup developed what we now call scientific sampling.
and Gallup challenged newspapers who had been saying, Literary Digest is saying Roosevelt's going to lose. Gallup was saying, I don't think that's right. I think Roosevelt's going to win, and I think he's going to win big. He challenged newspapers to put the, the two predictions side by side. He said, look, put my predictions right next to Literary Digest's. And so you see in the, in the headline here, right, Institute, which is the Gallup Institute, says, hey, Roosevelt's going to get reelected, and he's going to win big. So people are like, wait a minute, why, why are these two polls so different? I don't understand. Literary Digest is saying Roosevelt's going to lose. This Gallup guy is saying Roosevelt's going to win. Well, long story short, have you ever heard of President Alf Landon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't either. Literary Digest blew it. Literary Digest blew it big time. They were completely wrong. Roosevelt won re-election in one of the biggest landslides in our history. And he absolutely crushed Alf Landon. He absolutely crushed it. So the question is, why? Why did Literary Digest get it so wrong and Gallup get it so right? And it has to do with the type of poll they use. Said before, Literary Digest used, what's it called, the informal one? Straw poll. A straw poll. Literary Digest used a straw poll where they basically just mailed out a bunch of ballots <laughs> and then based their opinions on whoever mailed them back. Okay? So we'll just mail out a couple couple million ballots, and based on however many we get back, we'll make our predictions. Well, what's happening in 1936? What's the country going through? Great Depression. The Great Depression. So if you're mailing out a whole bunch of ballots, We're not get that. well, they got some back. The problem was, the ones they got back in the middle of the Great Depression were predominantly for people who were wealthy. The people who were poor, people who were homeless during the Great Depression, they didn't get the ballots. And even if they got them, they're not going to waste the postage to mail it back. So the only people who mailed ballots back were wealthy people who tended to vote Republican. So this informal poll didn't give a true <coughs> picture of what the country felt. <coughs> Gallup's poll, the scientific poll, was much better. And here's why. And this you need to know. Because scientific polling... follows a formula. Instead of just asking anyone, Gallup asked a smaller group of citizens who were more representative of the total population. I'll say that again. Rather than, it's called scientific polling, and rather than just asking anybody, Gallup asked a smaller group that was more representative of the total population. And because of that, he got a better picture of how the country was actually going to vote. He didn't just get Republicans sending ballots back. He got a good survey of what the whole country might look like. And modern opinion polls are still done following this exact same way. <coughs> so Gallup came up with this in the 1930s, and we still use these same methods today to get an accurate picture of what public opinion is. So, second major topic now that we've sort of established where modern scientific polls came from, is how does it work? Right? How do you actually do it? Well, there's basically four steps to the modern opinion poll. Step one, you have to decide who you're going to survey. You have to decide what group you're going to survey. So 
So are, it depends on what you're interested in. Are you, are you only interested in surveying Democrats? Are you only interested in surveying Republicans? Are you only interested in what women think? Are you only interested in what African Americans think? You first have to figure out what group of people am I trying to survey. Step two. Once you know what group you're going to ask the questions to, you need to sample people from that group. And this right here is where George Gallup got it right. He didn't just ask anybody. He randomly called people in that group. Okay, in his case, he, he actually probably went out and did interviews because not that many people had telephones in the 30s, especially in the Great Depression. So figure out who you're going to ask, and then you need to randomly call people in that group. So most surveys today are done by telephone. Say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to survey all registered voters and I'm going to randomly call people in that group. Random is the key. Because if you're randomly calling people in that group, that ensures that you have an equal chance of getting someone that represents the wider population. Right? So put it this way, if there are, say, 55% women in the country and 45% men, if you're randomly calling registered voters, there's a 55% chance you're going to get a woman and a 45% chance you're going to get a man. Right? So if you're, as long as you're randomly calling, then you should get a, 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 a group of responses that looks pretty similar to the overall population. Does that make sense? Right. So if you just interview or, or if you randomly interview or call somebody up, you'll have a higher chance of life. Of it being accurate. Okay. Because it's going to better match the total population. If I said, boy, I want to know what all registered voters think about this topic, and then I only call men, I'm not going to have an accurate poll. Because I've left out half the population. If I say, I wonder what all Republicans think about this, and then I only call men, I'm not going to get an accurate picture. Because I'm leaving out half the population. So if you randomly call, then it, you're going to, you should get a, a, a response that looks pretty much mirrors the, the overall population. So survey and then sample. Who are we going to ask and then randomly call people in that group? Next, once you've gotten enough responses, you're going to sum up. Which simply means you're going to tally up your responses. How many people said yes? How many people said no? How many people said they're going to vote for Trump? How many people said they're going to vote for Clinton? How many people said, can't stand either one, not going to vote for either one of them? Right? You just add up all of your responses to see what you found. And then your last step is to include a margin of error. We need to know what a margin of error is because that impacts your poll. The margin of error is a number that indicates how accurate the survey is. The margin of error is a number that indicates how accurate the survey is. The smaller the number, the more accurate the survey. So when you see at the bottom of a survey, it tells you the margin of error. And it's always done as a, a plus minus. You'll see that. It'll say margin of error of plus or minus 3%. 3 to 4% is usually about the normal. So plus or minus 3%. A small number means they think it's a pretty accurate survey. If it's a large number, like if it's in the double digits, really if it's above 
right? It's not a very accurate survey. Because plus or minus 8% means it could be anywhere within a range of 16%. If it's 10%, it could be anywhere in a range of 20%. That's not very accurate. Right? That's like putting on a blindfold and throwing darts at a dartboard. Right? Maybe I hit it, maybe I don't. Okay? So you want your, your margin of error to be small. So if you see a large margin of error, I wouldn't trust the survey. It's probably not very accurate. Questions so far? This will help you when you see surveys in the newspaper, when you see candidates. And I'm gonna, probably won't have time today, but I'm going to show you guys an article about the first presidential debate and how Donald Trump doesn't understand scientific polling. So here's an example of a scientific poll, a scientific survey. Right? This is done by actually the Gallup Institute. This was from the 2012 election. And the question was, is there anything Mitt Romney or Barack Obama could say or do during the upcoming presidential debates that would cause you to change your vote? Tells you who they, so there's the question, it tells you who they survey, Obama or Romney voters. So that lets me know right there, they didn't ask undecided voters. They asked people who had already said, yeah, I'm going to vote Romney, or I'm going to vote Obama. Is there anything they could do to change your mind? They called, they called 1,317 people. They summed up their findings. So overall, only 15% of people said, yeah, I might change my mind. 83% said, nope, Mitt Romney could go up there and dance around naked with his hair on fire and I'm still voting for him. And then they gave us a margin of error, plus or minus three percentage points. So what that means is this 15% that they got, plus or minus three means it could be as high as what? 18. Could be as high as 18, or it could be as low as 12. That's still a pretty, pretty small window. So we would say this is a pretty reliable survey. It's pretty accurate. All right, so how's polling used? That's our third main topic here we need to discuss. So we've got an idea of where it came from and how it works. Like, okay, well, like, so what? How do we actually use it? Well, there's two main ways. The first is measuring public sentiment. We use opinion polls to measure public sentiment. Right? We want to know what the public thinks. So, for example, businesses will sometimes do scientific polls to learn about what buyers want. Businesses might use it to figure out, hey, what do the people want, right? Do they want a bigger camera in the iPhone, or do they want more storage space, right? They might do that. Or, yeah, the headphone jack. So business might use it. Um, news organizations like CNN are going to use them all the time to learn about people's opinions on major issues. And politicians will use them. They'll use them to see how well they're doing. Or what issues they should be focusing on. Also use them in political campaigns, right? While they are campaigning, they're going to use polls all the time. And there's three main polls they're going to use. Um, a benchmark poll 
is really kind of a before the campaign starts poll. Where the candidate will try to figure out what are the important issues that he or she needs to focus on. A tracking poll is a poll that's used during the campaign. Oftentimes, every single day, they're doing some polling to keep track of changes. Hey, at first, people were most concerned about the economy, but now they're more concerned about national security. Well, if people are most concerned about national security, you don't want to be going out and talking about taxes. You want to be talking about the issues that people care about. The last one is an exit poll, and this is after, this is an after poll. This is done on election day to figure out how people voted. So political campaigns use these all the time. They use these scientific polls all the time to keep track of what the voters think. And how did they vote? So that for the next campaign, <coughs> they know. Right? Hey, we talked a lot about the economy, but that wasn't the most important issue. So next campaign, we need to talk about something different. Exit polls are also the only way that we know how different groups voted. You see all the time, well, you know, 63% uh, of the African American vote went to Barack Obama. I think it was actually more than that. Well, the only way they know that is through exit polls. That's a scientific poll, right? Because when you go in, it doesn't ask you if you're African American or not. It just says who you voting for. Right? So hopefully you get the sense that this scientific polling is massively important. Right? It's used all the time, not just by politicians, but also by businesses. Now there's also some ways, the last topic we're going to talk about that you have to be aware of is how can polling be misused? All right, we're going to talk about three, three main ones. Okay, the first one, we've already mentioned a little bit, straw polls. Right? Straw polls that are really informal are usually ways for people who are really either really passionate or really angry to vent. <clears throat> These are usually like internet polls where you can vote multiple times. Or, this is why I said American Idol, where you can call in. If I want Kelly Clarkson, this, um, that's my age right there, Kelly Clarkson was the first American Idol. Okay? I want Kelly Clarkson to win, so I am going to vote 50,000 times and vote for Kelly Clarkson. Okay? Right, but that's the danger of a straw poll. News organizations use them. I'll show you the article that talked about the first presidential debate. News organizations are using them, and people are mistakenly believing that they are the same as scientific polls. They're not. They're ways for people who are really passionate about something to voice their opinion over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. That makes them inaccurate. That makes them unreliable. So you got to watch out for straw polls because they're not giving you an accurate picture. Politicians will put them out there and say, look, I won the debate. No, you just have a lot of people who are repeatedly clicking. Push polls is the second one. A push poll is a poll that is usually taken close to election day. And it's designed to try to push voters away from supporting a, a certain candidate. It's designed to push people away from supporting a certain candidate. By asking, whoops, by asking um, biased questions. or spreading damaging information. 
So a lot of times these are sort of disguised like a scientific poll. You answer the phone, oh, hello, um, I'm conducting a survey about the upcoming presidential election. Would you be willing to answer some questions? Okay, sure. Um, question one, you know, who are you going to vote for, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? Um, I'm, I'm leaning towards Hillary Clinton. Oh, well, thank you. W would you still be interested in supporting Hillary Clinton if you knew that Hillary Clinton wanted to take away uh, your rights as an American citizen? Well, whoa, whoa, hang on. Would you still vote for Hillary Clinton if you knew she wanted to cut funding for, you know, this, that, or the other? Well, no, I, I mean, I didn't know that. So it's masked like a scientific poll, but it's not. It's kind of a dirty trick to try to, to yeah, so push polls are considered kind of unethical. And most of the time, it's not going to be campaigns doing that, but it may be an interest group. The last one we're going to talk about is loaded questions. And a loaded question is a survey question that's worded in such a way to try to force you to give a certain response. It's worded in such a way that it tries to force you to give a certain response. Response. So I'm going to go through some examples here with you. Here's an obvious loaded question. Barack Obama supports a government effort to take away your Second Amendment rights. Do you support this infringement on, on your constitutional freedoms? That's worded to try to make the person go, well, I mean, no, of course not. I'm not in favor of that. And then they'll turn around and say, 100% of people that we surveyed said no. Well, of course they're going to say no. You're kind of forcing them to say no. That's a loaded question. So some of them are blatantly obvious. Others, not so much. Here's a subtle one. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Any able-bodied person can find a job and make ends meet. That seems pretty neutral. Do you agree with this? When they asked this question, 65% of people said, yes, I agree with that. When they reworded it to make it less loaded, some people feel anybody, any able-bodied person can find a job and make ends meet. Others feel there are times when it's hard to get along and some able-bodied people might not be able to find work. Just by showing both sides rather than one side, they went from 65% saying, yeah, I agree with that, to 43% saying, I agree with that. So again, if we go back to that first question, where the 65% said yes, that's a loaded question. You're not sure, you're not, it's not a neutral question even though it doesn't seem loaded. So you have to also pay attention to the way that questions are worded, okay? Because that can impact the accuracy of the poll as well, okay? Guys, I'm going to post this video online, so if you realize, hey, I'm a little bit shy on some areas, what I would like to do, okay, is at the start of class tomorrow, you're going to have your commercials done, and I want you to print off your lecture notes. I'm not grading them, okay? But I do want to take a look at them to give you some feedback. Right, because this is a skill we've got to continue to work on. 